Hi everyone, Andrew Huffdaling with the Ninth Ohio Living History. Today, August 5th, 2022, marks 160 years since an event occurred which would be one of the defining moments of the Civil War for the Ninth Ohio Volunteers, the killing of their first colonel and brigade commander, Robert Latimer McCook. Many at the time, and still today, have called it a cold-blooded murder, but of course, there is always more to the story than meets the eye. Just as we used primary sources to uncover some of the details of the Niners' engagement at the Battle of Chickamauga, or of the election riot in 1855 in Cincinnati, we're going to dig a little deeper here and try to get some answers to questions that still plague us today. What were the circumstances of McCook's death? What was the military situation in northern Alabama during the hot, dry summer of 1862? Could his death be legally considered a murder? And was this just a circumstance of someone being in the wrong place at the wrong time, or was perhaps something more nefarious at play? Keep it right here, and we'll do our best to try and make sense of what was clearly a confusing situation for all involved. As always, I have pulled primarily from original accounts and tried to piece together as full an accounting of these events as possible, given that we're 160 years removed from the incident. So before we get into the details, let's talk briefly about Brigadier General McCook and learn more about who he was. Born the son to a prominent and powerful Ohio family, Robert was only 33 years old at the outbreak of the Civil War. He was partner of the law firm of Judge Stallo, who was an incredibly important figure among the Cincinnati German Americans. McCook's own family was powerfully connected with his older brother serving as the best man at the wedding of future Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton. This family provided 15 men to the cause of the Union, with over half of these rising to the rank of Major or higher, and six, including Robert, rising to the rank of Brigadier General or higher. Robert McCook was named Colonel of the 9th Ohio, despite not being German himself, due to his connections with both the German-American community in Cincinnati and the good his connections in Washington could do for the regiment. Indeed, Robert McCook was able to follow through time and time again, securing provisions when they were scarce, shielding the 9th Ohio from overbearing commanders, and allowing them to keep their precious Prussian drill and German language and customs. Though he was known in the community, Robert McCook had to earn their love and trust, which he did through hard campaigns in West Virginia and Kentucky, aggressive generalship, and unflagging devotion to the cause, peppered ever so slightly with a heavy disciplinary hand when needed. McCook's and the Niners' sensibilities quite often aligned and by the summer of 62, he was beloved not only by the 9th Ohio, but by most of the rest of his brigade as well. The route of McCook's fateful march would take the brigade from Corinth, Mississippi to Tuscumbia, Alabama, where they remained in camp for some time, after which they moved further east past Athens to the vicinity of Newmarket, a distance of about 150 miles. As May turned to June, in the waning weeks of spring grew hotter, the Niners had to have been looking for a fight. After the victory at Mill Springs in January of that year, the brigade had spent the remainder of the winter traipsing about Kentucky and Tennessee, seeing very little in the way of the enemy. They moved toward the sounds of battle at Shiloh in April, but missed the fight by a couple days. There, they spent weeks cleaning up the aftermath of the battle, burying the dead, collecting arms and equipment, and standing picket duty in the damp southern Tennessee spring. They endured the excruciatingly tedious campaign and siege of Corinth, Mississippi, shortly thereafter, and were one of the first federal troops to enter the town, only to find the Confederates had abandoned it the night before. So, when orders came to pack up baggage and head east into Alabama, it was likely with mixed emotions that the Niners left the Magnolia State hopeful to be heading into a direct engagement that would allow them once again to prove their prowess on the battlefield. For them and their beloved commander, that would unfortunately not be the case. Showing their eagerness to be rid of Mississippi as the brigade crossed the state line into Alabama on June 22, 1862, 
the Niners let loose a cheer. Despite their optimism to be on the move, they were well aware of the reports of the constant harassment by Southern guerrillas. There were reports that the 9th had experienced this firsthand, with one newspaper claiming that while the brigade was repairing a bridge, the men were continually harassed by partisans supported by the locals. Robert McCook sent word to them that as the harassment continued, he would commence to shelling the town. Once again, workers went out to repair the bridge and were shot at, at which point McCook ordered the guns into position and followed through with his promise. The bridge was finished in short order thereafter. Well prior to this, on May 2nd, however, Colonel John Basil Turchin, a Russian immigrant, led his troops into Athens, Alabama, where, allegedly in response to partisan acts against his men, he was said to have announced he would look the other way while his men set loose on the town. Athens was, quote, disgracefully plundered by Turchin's brigade. So, as the Niners marched eastward out of Corinth into Alabama, guerrilla warfare in the region was an established fact. By the last day of June, the Niners, their brigade, and in fact, their whole division, led by General George Thomas, was encamped near Tuscumbia, Alabama, which is right on the Tennessee River near Muscle Shoals and across the river from the town of Florence, also occupied by federal troops. Lieutenant Birch of 2nd Company of the 9th Ohio remarked that the town's previous occupants must have lived like robbers. By the time that they got there, the town had been picked clean with oxen, pigs and cattle being slaughtered and left dead in the streets. He said that it should be no surprise when the people get an unfavorable conception of Union soldiers. While stationed here, the federal soldiers exacted a toll on the citizens, both figurative and literal, the Niners playing no small part, charging exorbitant fees to ferry the locals across the river when it was their turn to guard the crossing. McCook himself was said to have laughed when he found out, remarking that he was glad to have found such good businessmen in the ranks. On the 4th of July, Independence Day, General Thomas ordered a national salute in the town square, followed by a dress parade of his division, which consisted of 12 regiments of infantry and three batteries of artillery. As most of the commanders of the assembled regiments and brigades were prominent citizens before the war, accustomed to giving speeches to mark such occasions, Thomas allowed them to erect a stage and podium from which to hold a series of patriotic speeches after the parade. The division, probably numbering well over 6,000 men, crowded together with the sullen citizens of Tuscumbia looking on. The first to speak was Brigadier General Speed S. Fry. A Republican who was active in the Presbyterian Church, he had commanded the 4th Kentucky at Mill Springs and now Thomas's 2nd Brigade. He began by reading the Declaration of Independence, then followed with some pretty harsh opening remarks, saying that the citizens must be either for us or against us. Those for us shall be treated well, he said. Those against us will be compelled to submit immediately. There is no neutral ground. The next few speakers, on the other hand, shared quite a different opinion. Colonel James Stedman of the 14th Ohio, who would go on to command the brigade shortly after McCook's death, arose to speak. A former lawyer, the editor of a Democratic newspaper, and a state legislator, he laid the blame for the war at the feet of the abolitionists, and in a painstaking manner attempted to explain the other historical causes behind the conflict. According to Private Thomas Downs of the 2nd Minnesota, the men of the 3rd Brigade, at least, were having none of it, and he concluded his speech early due to loud groans. Another speaker was Colonel John Harlan of the 10th Kentucky. A future Supreme Court Justice, Harlan would actually be the lone dissent in Plessy v. Ferguson, but he was, in fact, a former conservative Whig and know-nothing. Harlan laid out his case that slavery was, in fact, a divine institution and must not be interfered with under any circumstances. The mood amongst many of the men, including the vast majority of the 3rd Brigade, began to darken as the next speaker arose. Colonel John Connell of the 17th Ohio espoused an especially conciliatory tone, arguing that the federal forces were, in fact, only a band of loving brothers come down to embrace their deluded brethren who had gone slightly astray. 
To him, this war was a deep regret, pitting brother against brother, and he hoped his southern friends would think better of us and come back to the Union. As he continued, in one breath denouncing Lincoln, in the next claiming he was there with a sword in one hand and an olive branch in the other, his speech was cut short by shouts and cajoling from the crowd. By now, the mood was downright sour. Cries for Bob McCook burst forth from the 3rd Brigade, and McCook shot up like a rocket. And again, as Private Downs described, heavens how he did rake those who preceded him. You have insulted the whole division, he exclaimed. He then began to harp on democracy and slavery, wishing that one was in hell and that the other was there on top of the first, as the one had caused the seeds of the rebellion and the other had watered the plant until it bloomed. We come here to fight, he bellowed. This is no place to spin political theories, nor to smooth over treason. We are here to protect our government, to fight its enemies, to kill every man that opposes it, and to treat with kindness all who submit to its laws. This declaration was met with tremendous cheer. He continued, We are not here to shake hands with traitors, beg them to return to the Union, we are here to compel them to return. Still, louder cheers. This is not the time to plead the wrongs of our government and the rights of traitors. They have none. Men talk of emancipation and destruction of traitors' property with great indignation. Now, if it is necessary in preserving this government to burn down every house in this state, I am the man who will lead the party to do it. The only way to end this war is to fight it to an end. Continuing on to an electric reaction by his men in the audience, he said that he was opposed to all of the milk and water policies, which often required soldiers to leave unmolested the farms and goods of known secessionists, and sometimes even compelled them to share their rations with the locals. He also declared that he had little faith in any profound strategy or deep science, but believed there was magic in the bayonet. All the leniency we show them, he said, only brings down their ridicule upon us. We must not coax, but whip them into submission, and that too as soon as possible. Wrapping up his speech to loud cheers and shouts of hurrah for Bob and Bob against the world, McCook bounded down from the podium, and the scene was bedlam. So much so that Division Commander George Thomas made an announcement shortly thereafter that the program was ended, and that, quote, if the boys can't keep within the bounds, they won't be celebrating 4th of July anymore. Now, the reason I include this scene in the analysis of McCook's death is that there is some evidence that this speech may have been the spark which essentially put a target on his back. First of all, we have already established the prevalence of guerrillas in the area, and despite some claims to the contrary, most contemporary accounts from the brigade recount the general disdain the locals had for Union troops. There were very few, if any, Unionists in the region, and rather, the mood of the populace was decidedly pro-Southern. That alone should not be surprising, but one of the newspapers providing a contemporary account of these speeches also cited various citizens moving about the crowd, quote, looking as though they had stolen sheep. A seemingly random, innocuous quote, right? But consider this. In a post-war autobiography, Private Frederick Finnup of the 9th Ohio gives his account of McCook's speech, but notes at the end that the speech likely ended up costing the general his life. Now, Finnup has some other theories that we'll go into in a moment, but I think it's safe to say that by July 4th, Robert McCook himself had attracted the attention of the locals and likely partisans who often relied on these locals for intelligence. Most of the division remained in and around Tuscumbia and Florence for two or three weeks, during which time interactions between the locals and the Federals were very contentious. Transgressions ranged from the petty, like when members of the 35th Ohio crowded the sidewalks to force ladies to pass into the muddy streets, to the serious, such as setting houses of known secessionists ablaze, as is well documented in the 9th Ohio's regimental history, De Neunen. On Sunday, July 27th, insult was added to injury when the same Colonel Harlan, who made a pro-slavery speech three weeks earlier, arrested a preacher while he was conducting service 
for a sermon he gave asking for prayers for the southern cause and to expel the northern invaders. It is also during this time when Robert McCook, who is described as being im kräftigsten Menesalter, in the primest of the primes of his life, comes down with dysentery. One of the interactions described by Philip, and again, I have to stress, this is a post-war recollection, but one of the interactions between the Niners and the locals was quite strange, and when taken in context with everything else, makes one sit back and think, wait a minute. Philip describes an encounter where some locals arrive in a carriage, not something out of the ordinary, as by all accounts, citizens seem to have been allowed to pass freely along the roads. But as Finnup and some of his comrades were on guard duty, they were approached by these locals. They stopped, and they didn't want to pass. They only wanted to know, was this the camp of Robert McCook? And how is he feeling, by the way? Finnup says then the driver turned the carriage back around, and the group headed back the other way. Toward the end of the month, the Niners and the 3rd Brigade were ordered east, across northern Alabama to rendezvous with troops in southern Tennessee. This route would take them about 100 miles. Halfway between Florence and their destination was Athens, the subject of Turchin's wrath just two months prior. At this exact time, word was circulating in southern papers that Turchin's court-martial had come back guilty. But rather than a punishment, his sentence was nullified by President Lincoln, and instead he was promoted to Brigadier General. McCook, for his part, was completely debilitated by his sickness, and not one to be stuck in a hospital, he had a medical wagon rigged up with a bed in the back and a small escort surrounding him. McCook was well known to be a man of action, often leading his own scouting parties, a fact combined with his famous name that surely was not lost on partisans looking for a target. With a recognizable name, stature, and now a slow-moving, conspicuous wagon, conditions were very ripe for an attack against someone who admittedly had a tendency to wander at times. So let's set the scene on August 5th, 1862. The events of that day are incredibly confusing, so let's talk about the sure facts as we know them to start. The 2nd Minnesota had been the lead regiment the day prior, which meant this day, the line of march, would be the 35th Ohio in the lead, followed by the Niners, then the baggage train, then the 2nd Minnesota in the rear. The 18th U.S. Regulars, which was still part of the brigade at the time, had been on detached duty and so moved out on the same route well before the rest of the column. Within just a few hours of their departure, the column took a wrong turn. As the troops were sorting themselves out, McCook in his ambulance wagon, along with his party of small aides, ranged several miles ahead of the column on the correct route. With McCook and Captain Hunter Brooke in the back of the wagon and McCook's body servant, John, driving, the rest of the party consisted of about a dozen or so men, including several members of the band. A small detachment of the 1st Ohio Cavalry rode along in support. In the midsummer heat, fresh water was always a concern, so this party had spread out somewhat in search of water for the men and a suitable camping spot. About noon, his party was attacked by scores of men on horseback wearing no uniforms of any kind. The men on foot scattered, those on horseback rode back in the direction of the approaching infantry column, while John attempted to turn the wagon and make it to safety. Moments later, the encounter was over, with band member Richard Meinhart wounded with a saber cut to the head, three captured and several missing. Worse yet, Robert McCook lay dying from a gunshot wound through the hip into his bowels. The Confederate partisan rangers had carried the mortally wounded McCook into a local farmhouse where they abandoned him upon their retreat. He was quickly attended to by the surgeons from the 9th and the 35th, but the verdict came quickly. There was nothing that could be done other than to make him as comfortable as possible. He would die at about noon the next day. Contemporary sensationalism, as well as differing accounts, really muddy the waters as to what really happened. But with a close look at each account, we can point out some very specific details and interpret how we should view this whole sequence of events. So let's start with the official account, quote unquote. This account consists of the reports of two individuals, Colonel Ferdinand Vanderveer, uh, who had provisional command over the brigade while McCook had been ill, and then George H. Thomas, the commander of the division, and Vanderveer's direct superior. We'll look at their reports and see what new information each of them brings to the table. 
So first you have Vanderveer's report where we have the first claim of the Confederates shooting first. Thomas's report states that the attack was made by regular cavalry, as the captor of McCook's aide identified himself to be. Interestingly, though, both Vanderveer and Thomas indicate that they had reason to believe the attack was pre-planned and even supported by the locals. After this point, the accounts begin to differ, and some really wildly. It's important to remind ourselves that when we look at primary sources, we need to be cognizant of when the account was written, and by whom, and who the audience was. The most contemporary account we have from someone who was actually on the scene in the immediate aftermath of the killing is that of Lieutenant David Schaefer of the 35th Ohio, which would have been at the head of the column rushing up to the small farm where McCook was attacked. Lieutenant Schaefer says, as soon as the gunfire was heard, Major Boynton of his regiment took off on his horse as the men moved on the double quick. Shortly thereafter, Boynton returned at the gallop with the rebel force behind him, which, after seeing the 35th deploying in line of battle to engage them, smartly turned tail and rode away. Schaefer confirms that McCook's bodyguard essentially deserted the general without firing a shot, but he also claims that McCook was firing his revolver in self-defense. This is the only federal soldier who makes this claim, and he tempers his account by laying at least some of the blame on General McCook himself, saying, quote, Whatever the sensational newspaper writers may say about this unfortunate and to us most calamitous occurrence, Colonel McCook owes his untimely death to his own foolish indiscretion. Our next account comes from a Niner writing the day after Schaefer's letter to his wife. On August 10th, Lieutenant Friedrich Bertsch of 2nd Company of the 9th Ohio wrote to the German language newspaper, the Cincinnati Volkskoin, which published it on September 7th. Bertsch describes an interaction earlier that day on August 5th where the brigade is stopped for a rest near the farm of another German immigrant who happened to live there. He intimated that there was a strong guerrilla band operating in the area, perhaps a few hundred strong, and that they were working with the locals, his neighbors, who he claimed were all secessionists. At this time, McCook was already separated from the brigade, and the staff officer who heard this immediately called for skirmishers to be sent out on the flanks, a move which only increased the distance between the two parties due to the delay. Another point Batch makes is that while it is true that McCook and his party were out in the advance searching for water, it was very curious to see several farmers along the way offering fresh water to the troops with smiles on their faces. After the fact, a seemingly suspicious activity by folks who were deemed by most to be the most staunch secessionists. When the shots rang out, Batch claimed, there were no surprised faces among these locals, only stares. The Niners' former chaplain, and now captain of 3rd Company, Wilhelm Stengel, did not have much to add to these accounts other than the mention that Private Konstantin Bozhak, one of the men who was captured, identified the irregular troops who perpetrated the attack as a company of rebel cavalry under Forrest, with the rest being local bushwhackers. He claimed that while a prisoner, the guerrillas talked of the gruesome deeds they wanted to commit against the Federals and argued over who had had the honor of shooting McCook. The contemporary press in general, especially in the North, had plenty to say about the incident, but most of the accounts, even those published well after the fact, are riddled not only with errors and inaccuracies, but also blatant partisanship. Several reports claimed McCook was taken out of his wagon and executed right there in the middle of the road, as is shown in this terrible illustration in Harper's Weekly. It is very important to understand that we should always take newspaper accounts with a grain of salt. There's not a single contemporary account from someone who was there that corroborates most of these wild claims. And so while they're an interesting side note to the history of this incident, they themselves are not factual history, and I won't be going into any great detail on them in this video. I will mention, though, that the northern newspapers were not the only ones writing about this incident. And, well, let's just say some of them had opinions. The Memphis Daily Appeal ran a story two weeks later saying it was well sped, that bullet of that gallant partisan ranger. From this point on, the contemporary accounts, at least from those who were anywhere near the scene of the incident, dry up, and all we are left with are mostly post-war recollections and reminiscences.
Frederick Kyle, author of the 35th Ohio's Regimental History, adds in the fact that the 18th U.S. Regular Infantry, as mentioned before, had traversed the same road just hours earlier, and they had encountered no trouble at all. Coming back to Frederick Finno, who wrote an autobiography 10 to 15 years after the fact, he confirms the account of the helpful German living along the road, as well as the seeming lack of surprise by the locals when the shooting began. He says he noticed the folks' faces, a grim, revengeful smile passing over their faces when the shots were fired. Up until this point, we have only heard from federal soldiers who were on the scene. I would be remiss if I didn't include any account from the other side. However, Confederate primary sources and records are notoriously spotty, even more so for soldiers that, at the very least, were operating on the boundary of what could be called legal in time of war. There is, however, one post-war interview given by someone at the center of the incident, a man named Frank Gurley who was said to have been the one who fired the shot that killed Robert McCook. After the attack, there was a massive manhunt for Frank Gurley, who was said to have been the captain of what was at the time a company of the 4th Alabama Cavalry. However, as evidenced at his trial, there were some very serious questions about whether he was an officially commissioned officer or not. And being caught operating in such a manner as a private citizen was definitely a recipe for quite a severe punishment, including death. The interview, which appears in a 1906 issue of The Confederate Veteran, presents some evidence that is pretty tenuous at best, but let's consider Gurley's claims and compare them to what we know and what the other evidence says. So over 40 years after the fact, Gurley's account immediately comes into question when he admits he could not even give dates as to when McCook was killed, as they had no way of keeping track of time, living only on what they could get and sleeping where they were able. He admits to cooperation among the locals, but says that they only informed him that there was a herd of beef cattle being driven by the Federals. He claims that they were engaged with a force of cavalry for over a quarter of a mile before they came upon McCook's ambulance, with two men, one uniformed and the other not. Gurley says he fired three shots, but only at the man in uniform in the back of the wagon. The killing of General McCook, he claimed, was an accident. Now, there are several things wrong with how Gurley characterizes these events in the interview. Mind you, this interview was given just as close to World War I as Finnup's recollections were to McCook's killing. For one, there were no cattle being driven by the Federal Column ever mentioned by any of the Federal accounts either before or after the shooting. Secondly, Gurley's account mentions emptying 21 saddles of the cavalry escort. However, we know that there likely weren't even 21 individuals in the party escorting General McCook. Further, examining the roster of the 1st Ohio Cavalry reveals not a single trooper wounded or killed on or about August 5, 1862. There are, however, several, though not as many as 21, listed as wounded or killed a few weeks earlier at a skirmish near a place called Cortland, Alabama, just east of Tuscumbia. In my opinion, it's very likely that Gurley is misremembering the facts in his interview with Confederate veterans. He may be conflating two or more events that happened in the weeks prior to his actions on August 5th, but it is noteworthy that he also describes the reaction of the locals to this accident saying a few days later they were received as heroes in Huntsville. Quote, cheers, tears, and flowers were showered upon them. Even Captain Gurley's horse was wreathed with flowers, the whole community joining in the laudations. After the killing of Robert McCook, Frank Gurley was the subject of a massive manhunt and was eventually captured, tried, and sentenced to be executed, a sentence which was never carried out. The story of the hunt for Gurley and his trial is interesting and certainly a worthy study for some other project, but we won't be addressing that on this video. I would, however, like to talk about the immediate aftermath of the killing of Robert McCook. If there were any doubt that federal troops in the region were capable of committing acts of violence against the civilian population, the actions of the Niners from the moment they burst on the scene proved otherwise. One of the first to arrive, Lieutenant Schaefer of the 35th Ohio again described the scene as the Niners arrived in a letter to his wife. 
The 35th had already found a young man hiding under the bed in one of the farmhouses where the mortally wounded McCook had been left and was being cared for. As he sat under guard under the shade of a tree, several Niners rushed up, one seizing the prisoner by the collar and shouting, You damned rascal! You killed my colonel! Another private raised his musket and brought it down, hitting the prisoner on the head. A third then simply lowered his musket about a foot from the man's face and pulled the trigger, mortally wounding him and leaving him to die. From this point, the whole scene was absolute chaos. The farmhouses in the immediate vicinity were burned, any able-bodied men or other civilians thought to be involved were rounded up, and Private Finnip claims that a few of the prisoners, after being brought to headquarters, were sent out of camp under a guard of hard men and finished in the woods. Die Rache des Neuten Regiments, the vengeance of the Niners, was swift, brutal, and spread quickly. Scores of men from the regiment, along with a large portion of the 2nd Minnesota, scattered across the countryside, avenging the death of their beloved colonel throughout the night. Soon, all buildings within several miles were aflame. Upon news of McCook's death the next day, the body was removed from the farmhouse where he lay, and that building was set aflame as well. Lieutenant Birch said that rogue place could deserve no other fate. Birch also claims that the houses of the poor were spared, as well as those without weapons who were not identified as members of the band. But we know from several other contemporary accounts that some Niners were not quite as judicious in their dealings with the locals as Birch wanted to portray in his letter to a widely circulated German language newspaper. Southern newspapers also sensationalized the brigade's revenge upon the countryside, with some accounts inflating the numbers of partisan and civilian casualties into the hundreds. Given the sparse and remote area, these claims are also highly skeptical. It's also notable here that despite there being such a focus on the events of the 5th and the 6th, General George Thomas did not issue General Orders No. 8 until August 8th. It was this order that nearly all Niner sources reference as the reason they stopped the rampage out of sheer respect that they had for Thomas. McCook's body was sent back to Nashville under a strong guard where it arrived at the Commercial Hotel on the 7th. From there, it was sent along the river to Louisville. On that same day, a deputation from Cincinnati was formed to meet the body at Louisville and escort it home. On the 8th, it arrived at the Galt House in Louisville, and the next day was taken up the Ohio River to Cincinnati. Already at 7 a.m. on August 10th, the streets were lined with throngs of onlookers to watch the body be transported to the courthouse. Led by a troop of 40 policemen, two companies of infantry, and a band from the local federal barracks, the column slowly made its way up Broadway to 3rd Street, then west to Race, to 6th Street, then to Maine, and finally northward to the courthouse, where the body lie in state at the Rotunda until the next day. A crowd of thousands filed past until well after midnight. At about noon the next day, August 11th, a year to the day after the Niners had celebrated a Tornfest in the mountains of West Virginia, the streets surrounding the courthouse were lined with mourners while the Episcopal funeral rites were performed. A German men's choir sang a song which, through careful research, we were able to discover came from an 18th century German Freemason's songbook. A surprising find that leaves us no reason to believe that Robert Latimer McCook was not, in fact, a Freemason. There will be more information on this song at the end of the video. After the conclusion of the funeral rites, the pallbearers bore the casket to the hearse where the column would proceed to Spring Grove Cemetery. The streets were lined with mourners, bells tolled throughout the city, and heavy cannon at the forts surrounding the Queen City sounded off in salute. All city business for the day was canceled. The procession outside had swelled greatly in number while the rites were being performed inside, and now consisted of approximately 1,000 infantry, cavalry, and artillery, including 82 members of the 9th Ohio who had either escorted the body to Cincinnati or were already there convalescing for one reason or another. Included as well in the funeral procession were over 300 members of the local Turner Clubs, several worker societies, and literally hundreds of carriages following the hearse. And even McCook's favorite horse, riderless, draped in black, made the long, solemn trek towards Spring Grove Cemetery.
The followers were dismissed at the Brighton House, while the remainder of the escort continued on. His body was laid to rest, quote, situated in the most beautiful spot in the cemetery, on the top of a mound, around which are interred 300 federal soldiers in rows, located near the main entrance to the cemetery and on the border of the lake. The legacy of Robert Latimer McCook and the effect he had on the city of Cincinnati and Cincinnati Germans in general and the 9th Ohio and the members of the 3rd Brigade specifically is unquestionably one of love and admiration based on the descriptions of his funeral alone. The words of those who served under him describe a relationship much like that of a father and his sons, for Robert always took care of his men, shielding them from some of the more problematic aspects of Army life. As to the incident of the killing of Robert McCook himself, now we have a much fuller picture of the situation in northern Alabama in late summer of 1862, and hopefully we gain a little more clarity on the events which were its catalysts. Questions obviously still remain. Was the killing legally a murder? Does that designation even have any relevance, given the seemingly lawless manner in which federal troops, including the Niners, were operating in that region? How closely were the 4th Alabama Cavalry and the local citizens working together? Could McCook have been poisoned? I don't think we'll ever get an answer to any of these questions, but the details and accounts we have laid out in this video have hopefully opened some eyes and pulled back a little of the mystery and legend on what was clearly a confusing situation. Finally, I'd like to circle back to the song sung by the Menor Corps at Robert McCook's funeral. It took us some time, but working together, Don Toltzman, Chris John Bolt, and I were able to track down this song using a few of the details provided in the August 12, 1862 account in the Cincinnati Enquirer. The song was located in the songbook Freemason Songs with Melodies, published in Berlin in 1795. With help on the arrangement from Ted Baldwin, Dan Wellert was gracious enough to lend us his voice and sing a version of the melody of that song. With that, I'd like to thank you for joining us, and we will let Dan close the video. Until next time. Schlaf us ab, du teurer deiner Bruder, schlummer us ab, nicht stora deiner Bald sehen wir dich, beste Bruder, wieder. Bald sehen wir das Wohl, alle wie du.